Today on the Everything 80s podcast, the story of British Knight's shoes. Hey there, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s podcast. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out today. There are many big name sneaker companies out there and shoes go hand in hand with sports, music and pop culture. But an upstart shoe company in the 80s was the one that really got the ball rolling. British Knight Shoes came out in 1986 and offered a variety of fashion athletic sneakers. They were able to impact the culture by aligning themselves with the emerging art of hip hop and help to define the decade. So that's what we're going to be looking at here today. Before we start, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe, if you want, wherever you find your podcast. I should be there. Here we go. So I have to start with a story. As a kid growing up, I felt like British night shoes were taunting me. I loved the whole world of sneakers in the 1980s, from Converse, High Tops, to, of course, British Knights, to the new upstart Nikes. When I was seven years old, I don't know if you, depending where you lived, uh, in Canada and through North America, there was a serial called Pro Stars. And it was a serial that w- featured Wayne Gretzky, who's our Canadian icon. And I'm not sure if it was sold through the States, but it, it, they were trying to launch it all over the place. And they ran a contest for when when the series was first released and i won third prize in whatever our local area was and it was a pair of brand new nike shoes which were relatively this is what year is this this is like 83 so i mean 84 th- th- so they're still relatively new and like these were shoes we'd never be able to afford to have. So to win something like that was absolutely mind blowing. So I don't know if that got me started in loving shoes, but British Knights to me were one of the coolest things of all time. And again, I knew I was never going to own them. The closest I got were the knockoff varieties we got from our local Zellers. If you're Canadian, you know what that is. Uh, but you know, you, you'd find these knockoff versions all over the place. So that was as close as I would get. The appeal of all shoes in the eighties, of course, always is so strong, especially the big ones, Nike, Reebok and Adidas, but British Knights were really at a different level in the eighties. They just seemed cooler. There, there was just something more, um, that just sort of connected to culture Uh, compared to Nike, Reebok, and Adidas, who would eventually later on, but this is sort of showing how British Knights did pave the way. And it turns out this was no accident. This was their whole plan. They did a lot of smart marketing and maneuvering to put themselves at the forefront of culture, especially the emergence of hip hop. And this helped them create great awareness of themselves. So we're going to look at what British Knights shoes Uh, were how they were at the forefront of what seems commonplace by the shoe industry today and really why they need to be on the Mount Rushmore of sneakers if that even exists. Okay, so what were British Knight shoes? In case this is all new to you, they were best known as a white high top sneaker that came out in the 80s. So they featured some pretty abstract designs, colors, and graphics, and that really made the shoes stand out from the crowd. This is other shoe companies weren't doing anything like this yet. Like, so that pair of Nikes I won were completely plain, they were like this sort of bluish suede with the white vinyl. They, they, you'd see these more like the retro versions now, but the, there was nothing flashy about a lot of these shoes. The bold imaging and features of British Knight shoes were part of their direction as these were meant to be a fashion statement as much as a functional shoe. That's the big secret here. They had various sizes and styles of sneakers, including lower top varieties. But when I think of British Knights, I think of the big, chunky, bold version that seemed like the best clothing accessory there was at the time. We'll get into some more specifics, uh, but if you want to see some of the images and ads and the early commercials, I'd recommend going to the show notes for this episode, just the whole blog version of it. So it's everything80spodcast.com slash British Night Shoes, but wherever you're listening, 
uh, whatever app or YouTube or Spotify or whatever, there'll be a link to go to it. So you can get an idea of what these were, either if you don't know about them or if it's been a while and you're trying to remember exactly what they look like. But at the very least, just do a Google image search and you'll get a good idea of this sort of iconic piece of 80s footwear. So here's the history. And as a kid, as a stupid idiot kid, I assume these shoes originated in England. But I also thought, you know, Chewbacca was real for a short period of time. So that's what I was dealing with. British Knights started out in New York City in 1983. They didn't originally begin offering up sneakers, but instead started with a whole other line of footwear, boat shoes. The whole company started as Jack Schwartz Shoes, which was a family-run company. They'd been in the shoe game for a while, and they were now going on eight decades and four generations working in the business. This started all the way back in 1839 in the heart of the Depression. They set up shop in Manhattan on 115 West Broadway. These days, they're now located in Soho, but they started out as a wholesaler of other shoe brands. The founder, Jack, passed away at an early age, but the family jumped in to keep the business going. Jack's son, Donald, kept things going. His sons would be instrumental in the growth of British Knights. The first line of their own shoes came out in 1972, and they were called Pro Players, and the success of the company started to grow. They weren't British Knights just yet, though. But the business is growing to where they had to open up offices in China. Today, uh, they outfit people like Guy Harvey and Emeril Lagasse, and they they started getting into a different line of shoes geared towards those who work in the service industry and restaurants and everything like that. But it was the success of these pro players and that of is what led them to create British Knights and the British Knights brand and then launch that line of boat shoes in 1983. So remember British Knights, they didn't start out as athletic anything. They were just straight boat shoes. And then this would change when one of Donald's other sons would join the team. Larry Schwartz is the man behind the sneakers. He joined on in 1983 and didn't take long to inject some youth and a new direction into the company. His goal was to add an athletic footwear division to the company, but he wanted to make it more than just a pair of running shoes. His vision was to create a fashion athletic footwear option to be released by British Knights. This all came about as he was literally looking out his front door and noticing the changing landscape of pop culture. The growing rise of hip-hop was introducing a very expressive new art form. Hip-hop is not just about rapping, but involves other components such as breakdancing, DJing, graffiti, you know, some may call graffiti vandalism, and there may be some truth to that, but it's another one of the forms of artistic expression. And if you've been through different areas of, uh, you know, Manhattan, the Bronx, Brooklyn, you've seen some of the incredible work where it's kind of hard to call this um, graffiti, um, or at least, you know, vandalism when it, it's so incredibly artistic. Hip hop and its culture was introducing a wide variety of new colors, fashion, and style. And Schwartz was seeing this in things like, you know, graffiti on the sides of the buildings and whatever. There is so much creativity and boldness in the colors being used. And he thought this needed to be reflected in a shoe. The other big shoe companies were still focused on athletic performance, but British Knights would also be about fashion and style. And this is the whole sort of core fundamental with British Knights. It's striving for fashion and not just performance. It wasn't just the hip hop demographic they were looking to target, but all forms of youth culture and music. British Knights shoes would set themselves apart from other companies like Reebok and Nike by focusing on the inner city kids. They would specifically focus on the young male market, but the main thing was about creating culture in shoe form. British Knights would be a music-driven brand. That would be kind of the core of everything as well. Again, very commonplace today, but at the time, this really hadn't been done before, especially by a shoe company. If you head over to BritishKnights.com, you can see the whole history of their marketing and advertisements over the years, which is really cool. But again, I've linked some of those or, you know, included some of those images on the show notes today. But, you know, make make no mistake, British Knights were still a very athletic shoe that you were able to find on the basketball court as easily as you could find uh, on the street corner breakdancing. 
Shoes and athletic sponsorship were just starting to emerge with the introduction of the Nike Air Jordan in 1984, but they had barely been in the market or been on the market for a year at the advent of British Night Shoes. Michael Jordan is obviously a massive star, but he was just coming into his own at this point. I'll have an amazing <laughs> show coming up about the story of when Magic Johnson turned down Nike um, and how that all came about and how they went with uh, Michael Jordan. It, it's pretty crazy, but that that's a whole other thing coming up. So, you know, he's, Jordan's obviously a massive star, but again, he's just coming into his own at this point. He's not the icon. We know him now. Uh, for British Knights to fully integrate into the culture and become a fashion statement, it would mean aligning themselves with the new style of music that is catching on like wildfire. And this is connected now to the birth of hip hop and the How You Like Me Now campaign. And going back to myself here, I loved hip hop growing up in the 80s. I still do today. But Again, the 80s was an amazing time as this art form was just really being created and taking off. I like, you know, a lot of the regular pop music and top 40 stuff you'd hear on the radio, but it, it's just something about this whole new genre captured my and many others, you know, imagination. You know, I loved Run DMC and LL Cool J, Beastie Boys, um, Rock Kim, like all the old greats, but I, I love the novelty rap too, like everyone did, like Tone Loke and Young MC. And the very first cassette tape that I ever bought was DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, the He's the DJ on the Rapper album, my very first cassette. I was also aware of what wasn't exactly mainstream rap at the time, like Cool Mo D being the best example. And that ties in with his song that was almost impossible not to be aware of, the song How You Like Me Now. Songs like this have a bit of a dated feel to them now, but the soul and the passion is still there. With its James Brown-inspired riffs, How You Like Me Now is a good song that represents this era of hip-hop. British Knights not only capitalized on hip hop culture, but specifically Cool Mo D's How You Like Me Now. In 1988, they put out a line of sneakers inspired by the song and also included a commercial that acted as a music video too. A very groundbreaking idea. And again, uh, depending where you are right now, if you can get on YouTube, you can look up the BK Sneakers How You Like Me Now commercial. Or if you're at the show notes, there's a link to that video as well too, just so you can see it. It's to describe it, there's an actual knight dribbling a basketball to the sneakers, which are sort of self dancing. And I don't know, but th this this whole shoe line already is blowing people's minds, myself included. And this commercial and combining it with hip hop all at the same time is amazing. The campaign also was launched with a print marketing um, campaign, too, that had ads that incorporated the same type of colors and graphics that were displayed on the shoe. Where other shoe companies were putting out boring, run-of-the-mill ads, British Knight shoes were doing some pretty out-there stuff. It was bold, it was weird, but it couldn't be ignored. Hip-hop at the time was, you know, really at its infancy as far as commercialism compared to today where it's become an $80 billion industry. So they were kind of perfect companions to go on this journey together. It was interesting, too, because it's around this time that Run DMC would release their song, My Adidas. And this was another monumental moment of hip hop and shoe culture coming together. But in the case of this song, Run DMC was already talking about an established shoe that they happened to like. Nothing was done specifically for Adidas shoes to become a symbol of pop culture. That was all due to Run DMC. The difference with British Knight shoes is that they were capturing the essence of hip hop and reflecting this in their many styles of shoes. And then, you know, over the years, they would also work with great acts like Public Enemy, Technotronic, and they'd, you know, even join forces with MC Hammer. So let's look at the success of British Knight shoes. And they were a massive hit right out of the gate. The timing of their release was perfect as it caught that sweet spot of the emergence of hip hop and the embrace of sort of new, unique and individual styles. One massive thing that made them stand out 
among other things, was their focus on variation. Looking back at that Adidas example with Run DMC, <clears throat> their shoes always stayed pretty much the same with very little or no different additions. You know, they'd maybe change the stripe color or whatever, but the classics were just the white with the black um, stripes on it. And that was the case for most shoe companies. British Knights changed all this by offering a wide variety of styles, colors, and versions. Today, of course, we're very familiar with new shoe releases such as, you know, Yeezys, LeBrons, Jordans, Air Force Ones, and they'll put out specific editions that are one-time shot that collectors and shoe lovers pay top dollar for. In the 80s, this wasn't a thing at all until British Knights. British Knights would release new collections at least three to four times a year. This is the one big thing that I really remember about British Knights. If you saw like one of the amazing new shoes and trust me, I did. I'd check out all of them. Um, you know, they put out, say this awesome new one with the color and combinations and things you love. Um, you only had one chance to get it after that. You wouldn't see it again. They had inadvertently created an even larger demand for their shoes and they could start putting out more and more unique versions. No surprise, though, you know, they were a huge hit with the 15 to 24 male demographic. Urban communities ate them up and their unique catchphrase, the shoe ain't nothing without the BK button, propelled their diamond shaped logo into the mainstream. They would even appear in a video game. 1989's arch rival video game, do you remember that by Midway, would feature British Knight shoes. And then the way a lot of kids that were, you know, not necessarily in tune with hip hop culture and style and everything. The way these kids would find it was the inclusion of the shoe on Funhouse. Do you remember Funhouse, the game show with JD Roth, the cheerleader twins? The, again, to me, this is the pinnacle, one of the pinnacle moments of the 80s. This show was based around the greatest game show a kid could imagine. And I hope you know this thing. And if you do, you're remembering every minute of how epic it was. If you don't, if this, depending how old you are, you're going to have to just look this up on YouTube. There, there's good clips and I think there's entire episodes up still. Um, basically, kids got a chance to compete in challenges and earn points for the opportunity to run through the fun house, which was as amazing as it sounded. It was the fun house was filled with adventures and obstacles. And along the way you would collect tokens that corresponded to amazing prizes and cash. And I, I can't even explain what I would have done to run through that fun house at one point. And another big feature with the show was their tie-in with British Knights who sponsored them. As a young, dumb kid, I had no idea that, you know, everything I was watching at the time was basically a 22-minute commercial. That included Funhouse. But who gave a crap? The show was perfectly able to capture the coolness and uniqueness of these shoes. And host J.D. Roth, along with every contestant, would be wearing them. Along with sponsor J.C. Penny, they would make sure that British Knights were mentioned at every possible opportunity, and that was fine with me. So let's look at the future British Knights shoes and then their revival. So now we're going into the 90s. British Knights would step up their collaboration game, including a massive campaign with MC Hammer, who I mentioned earlier. They would now also cross over into basketball sponsorship, working with top athletes like Dominique Wilkins, Derek Coleman, and Lloyd Daniels. They would introduce their Dymacel technology, which was a silicone-filled diamond-shaped cushioning in the sole of the shoe. And if you saw these things or remember, it was mind-blowing. There was a window on the heel where you can see in and you could see this gel, whatever substance and just like straight up mind blowing. And I remember one kid at school who was lucky enough to have these and he stabbed it with a pen to see the silicone gel leaked out. And I think that's one of the defining moments of my life right there. There are also some alleged controversies with the shoes. In the early 90s, infamous street gang, the Crips, were fond of the shoes. And there was the thought that they wore them as BK stood for blood killer. That was, you know, in their minds and that started spreading around. And, you know, assuming you know your Crips and Bloods history, you can see how that all became a big issue. 
many schools and universities started banning the shoes because of this whole issue, but their popularity was already beginning to kind of slow down at this time anyway. The ever-changing nature of hip-hop style and fashion was beginning to push British knights to the side in favor of whatever else was new and cool at the time. But in 2014, British Knights began a comeback. Jack Schwartz's shoes got back into the mix with designer Darren Romanelli and Scooter Braun, who you might know as manager of Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande. And if you're a Taylor Swift fan, you're not a huge um, advocator of anything Scooter Braun's ever done. But he helped bring back the shoes in 2014, and they went back to their roots of style over function with the slogan, Artists are the new athletes. And it was a really pretty amazing marketing campaign, again, just to bring back the brand and sort of, you know, introduce it for the first time to a lot of people. So I'll start winding it down here. The interest in British Knight shoes clearly hadn't really gone away. It was, it was, it still existed due to that, you know, 2014 revival. This campaign was a huge success and people, kind of bought back into what they remembered or sort of embraced the, you know, kind of the pioneer of, you know, shoes and culture. And at the very least, it was at least a a tribute to this company that was the true innovator and really changed the game and sort of set in motion what would happen with all these future shoe companies and clothing lines and crossovers and music and hip hop. And they, they really started it all this tiny little company uh, based out of New York that started as, you know, making boat shoes became, you know, instrumental in combining fashion and culture at the same time. So I'll finish it off there. And like, you know, to me, British night shoes are a perfect symbol of the eighties. To me, they're, as relevant to define the decade as acid wash jeans and and mullets and and stuff like that and walkmans and every i think they're in the mix with all that again if you grew up at this time you might think of them in the same way too and i don't know if it was kind of that i was never going to have them <clears throat> not that they were a forbidden fruit or anything but the, the fact that they were so out of reach because they were too expensive for my family, made them just even more iconic in my mind. So I don't know, pretty interesting story on a a small company that had a major impact and, you know, carved out a nice little chunk of the 80s. So hopefully you remember it finally too, or if this is brand new, hopefully you learned something interesting. So I'll finish it off here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for taking the time. I know there's so many podcasts out there. So the fact that you're listening to this one means a lot. And if you're interested in supporting a show like this, as you know, there are more and more podcasts growing by the day and the the platform is amazing, but it, it's really changing a lot due to huge, you know, companies uh, taking over podcast platforms, huge podcast networks, celebrities, you know, specifically thinking of Joe Rogan when we talk about stuff like this, basically makes it a little bit tougher for smaller shows like this to stand out. But What I use is a platform called patreon.com and that's a way to help support the show for like a few bucks a month. And then there's different levels and at different levels, there are different rewards with it, different audio rewards. So say at the Boba Fett level I have, that gives you access to the Everything 80s Movie Club where I review the good, the bad, and the ugly of 1980s movies. And then, you know, at the different levels or different rewards, I won't go on too much about it, but if you're interested in seeing more about that, you can go to patreon.com slash 80s. So P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash eight zero s or again wherever you're listening to this there'll be a link to take you there if you want to see more but that's it for me i will be back soon with the new episode don't you dare miss it